Hi there folks, Mike here, and in this series I'm going to be talking to you about concurrency in C++. If you're not familiar with what concurrency is, it's the ability to allow us to do two or more things at any given time. And there is some ordering to these events. And if you're watching this series, likely you've heard about things such as threads, which is one way to achieve concurrency when programming. So I'm going to be talking about those, but in this particular lesson, I want to give us an introduction to what concurrency is, how it's different than parallelism, and why we need it or why it's a necessity. So let's go ahead and dive in. So first off, what is concurrency? And we can always start off with a definition here. The fact of two or more events or circumstances happening or existing at the same time. Okay, so the way I like to think about this is in a way that we as humans can understand. That is that we often try to multitask. We're often trying to balance multiple tasks at once. The reality is, though, us as humans, we're not really good multitaskers when it comes down to it. Think about a time where you've had to juggle 50 tasks at once and how productive you've been versus those times where you've been able to just focus, not have any worries, and just complete one task. So I bet there were some different results. But the reality is our brains are multitasking machines. They have to do many things at once. Likewise, computers are actually pretty good at multitasking. Likely, you have multiple browsers or applications open as you're watching this video here. So how can our computers do concurrent tasks and, and why should we allow them to? In the sense that concurrency could give us some additional performance. So this is the way that we typically look at software when we've been writing it. Typically, when we write software, we write it in a sequential fashion. We just have one instruction that executes, then the next instruction executes, and then another instruction executes that. So we have one CPU core focusing on one process that's gonna execute a series of instructions sequentially. And we can sort of imagine this as our function calls. So we have a main function, then we have one function that's called from it, another function that's called, and then maybe within this function we call something else. But there's still a sequential execution here. However, what if we could have a second path of our code executing concurrently? And this is exactly what I'm talking about in this lesson today and introducing you to the idea of concurrency. And if we allow the second path of code to execute, well, we're getting twice as much throughput potentially, and that we have two different paths in our code doing work. So this sounds great, right? And I want to sort of bring up some words of wisdom, words that aren't mine, but someone much wiser than mine, noting that performance is the currency of computing. And who does this come from? Well, this comes from Professor Charles Lyserson, who says you can often buy needed properties of software with performance. So to me, this is a really great motivation for concurrency. If I'm able to complete two tasks at once, I'm able to do something perhaps more interesting in my software. In the sort of context of games and graphics, maybe I'm able to render cooler uh, graphics in the environment of the world, run a better AI simulation, add physics, whatever it might be, you can add more of something or just otherwise provide a better user experience. So how can we get more performance and what are our tools? And this brings us back to the original question, which we've seen a definition of, but answering what is concurrency? So. There's an often sort of distinction that must be made between parallelism and concurrency. Concurrency is often interchangeably used in various contexts, at least in the real world when we're talking about doing something concurrently, and we mean at the same time. But in computer science, there's a slight distinction that I want to make, just so it's clear. That concurrency means that multiple things can happen at once, the order matters, and sometimes tasks have to wait on a shared resource. So in a way we're sort of synchronized or there might be some synchronization points that we have to keep in mind. Parallelism, on the other hand, means that everything happens once instantaneously. So when I snap my fingers, both happen at the same time. I don't have to wait for one or the other in a sequence. But perhaps if that's not the right analogy, uh, allow me to illustrate uh, in a comic what this means where the order matters and sometimes tasks have to wait on shared resources. And this is a comic by the late Joe Armstrong demonstrating concurrency versus parallelism. Parallelism where you have two coffee machines, 
two queues or two lines of folks waiting to get their coffee here versus concurrency where I have two folks who can line up at the same time uh, in different lines and maybe they can perform other tasks like checking their phone or doing some other task. But when it comes time to accessing some shared resource, the coffee machine, one person or the other does have to wait here. So that's the slight distinction between concurrency and parallelism. And again, if you just want to remember this, think about parallelism as happening instantaneously where it could do a hundred or a thousand or any number of things all at once versus concurrency where there might be the potential to be doing multiple things at once, but you are sharing resources and occasionally you might have to wait on that shared resource like this coffee machine here. So the note here is that concurrency or parallelism implemented correctly should also yield better performance. And that's likely why you're watching this and why you care. So there's also a necessity to concurrency. And I'll give a few real world examples like an orchestra, for example, in which you want to have musicians sort of synchronize. You don't want everybody playing at once or nobody playing at all. That wouldn't be a very good orchestra. So sometimes you have multiple parties playing at once. The sort of shared resource, if you want to think about it, is the conductor or the actual stage uh, who's deciding who gets to play and who they're uh, paying attention to or who the musicians are paying attention to, rather. In computer science, we might think about applications such as a memory allocator, a file system, network requests, and so on as applications where you'd want concurrent behavior. For example, you may want to be able to read from the same file from multiple different parties, but if you're writing to a file or writing some new information, you might have to wait until that write is complete before you can have multiple parties reading from it. And if we do this properly, again, concurrency should give us better performance. This idea that we can have separate threads of execution, with threads being one model of concurrency, performing some action with occasional synchronization points. So here's my orchestra example here. Again, you can just ideally think of concurrency as an application of a band playing where some of the instruments are taking turns playing. Maybe you have all the string instruments playing, maybe all the woodwind instruments, maybe all the brass and different variations. So there is some amount of synchronization being performed. You might also think of good concurrency as a good conversation at the dinner table. You're going to have shared resources that people are trying to acquire. People are taking turns talking. And meanwhile, they may be able to do other tasks like eat their food, check their phones, or do some other uh, tasks that they need to. So each person here, you'll notice, is also competing for a shared resource, which is a part of concurrency. We'll talk about that and how to make sure that only one person acquires some resource as we talk about the actual implementation. So a question you might be wondering is, does our hardware actually support concurrency? How is it that if I have a computer chip, which we often think of as a singular device, that if we're able to have multiple tasks happening at once? Well, to those who are watching this, you probably understand that you have multiple cores on most of your CPUs. Even your phone, for instance, has multiple cores or multiple brains that can process different tasks. And even within one of those uh, CPU cores, you're able to switch between tasks relatively quick. We call this a sort of timeshare system where each process that's executing gets a little time slice to execute and perform some task. But just to provide a few concrete examples, let me show you what our hardware looks like today. And the reality is that a single core processor has been getting faster and faster and faster. So on the x-axis here, I have the years. And on the y-axis here, I have the transistors. So transistors are the things that turn on and off and allow us to do computations. And if we get more transistors, we can get more computation. So we're somewhere in this range today. And Moore's law is in fact still alive, meaning that we're able to pack in more transistors on a chip every 18 to 24 months. Although this bit here about having only a single core, that's the part that's changed a little bit. Because now, as you know, we have multiple core machines. And again, if you check your laptop or your phone, you likely have multiple cores on that device. So the problem is that as Moore's law has continued and we've tried to pack more and more transistors onto a single chip, 
those transistors have to be packed closer and closer and closer together, to the point where we're thinking about things on the atomic level, where perhaps transistors are only a few nanometers apart. So at the time of the recording of this video, we're talking about you know, devices or cores that have transistors within, say, nine nanometers apart, whether they're Intel or AMD or whatever uh, architecture machines. And as you pack things more closely and try to switch those transistors on and off faster and faster, that generates more heat. And that becomes a problem where you can essentially melt your CPU chip. And as we're running things faster and faster, that also means we need more power to be supplied to these chips. And the power demands actually go up, not in a linear manner, but more uh, quadratic or exponentially, depending on the architecture. So the result of this is a lot of heat is generated. So if you're watching this, you'll understand that we need concurrency. We need to have multiple smaller cores in order to avoid this problem, which means that we can't just keep packing more and more transistors onto a single core machine because of this issue of heating. And you can read a nice article about this by Herb Sutter called The Free Lunch is Over to learn a little bit more about this. This was written well over a decade ago, and this problem we've known about for a long time. It's just now programmers are finally starting to adapt in more industries. And if you'd like to actually know the actual law uh, that is about how many transistors that we can pack onto machine and how power scales uh, not linearly with the amount of transistors that we pack on, this is uh, Dennard's, known as Dennard scaling. So you can read a little bit about how the energy consumption increases over time as we add more transistors. So again, the hardware industry has had to adapt, as I've mentioned, by allowing us to have multiple smaller cores on our machines. So. Does our hardware support concurrency? Yes, in fact, it does. In this way that it's almost a reality, or it has to, and that we have multiple cores now that must work together, maybe doing multiple things on a shared task and sharing resources on our computer. So an example of that shared resource might be the working memory that we have, and there's ways in the hardware to sort of handle things. But we'll usually be thinking about things as far as sharing on a per process level when we talk about actually programming threads. So just a few quick examples here, just so you can see some trends. Um, because I like games, I like using gaming examples, but you can see in an Xbox One, we have eight cores on our machine. Xbox Series X, you have eight cores as well. They're getting a little bit faster here, or quite a bit faster. Same thing with the PlayStation 5, getting more cores that are faster on our machine. So usually you'll have four or eight cores on any modern piece of hardware these days, uh, gaming consoles, in this generation having eight cores and i assume that that would go up in the future if there is a next iteration of the console cycle so this trend's nothing new though if you look at these different supercomputers here you'll notice that those supercomputers of the old added many more cores in order to run faster so concurrency and this idea of how to increase performance are not new ideas it's just we as programmers are going to have to learn how to take advantage of the hardware that we know is widely available. Because back in the day, the only folks who really had to worry about this problem were our supercomputer scientists. Now we, as programmers, need to learn how to do concurrent programming. So that's been an introduction to concurrency. So you have a little bit of an idea of the hows, the whys, Moore's Law, Dennard scaling, some of these ideas. So feel free to explore those more. But in the next few lessons, we're actually just going to dive into a model of concurrency by doing thread-based concurrency and programming this in C++. That's probably what you came for and what you're looking forward to learning more about. So let's continue on with that.